You're listening to The Leonard Lopate Show on AM820 and 93.9 WNYC. Shut your eyes and picture Audrey Hepburn. It's pretty easy, isn't it? Because hers is one of those faces you just don't forget. Since her death in 1993, she's lived on in two dozen films and through a seemingly endless collection of photographs. Audrey Hepburn's son, Sean Hepburn Farrer, helped put together a new selection of memorable images called Audrey 100, a rare and intimate photo collection selected by Audrey Hepburn's family. It's published by Sterling, and I'm very pleased that it brings Mr. Ferrer to our show today. Hello. Good afternoon. The 100 photos that comprise this book are the works of 25 photographers. Is there a photographer you feel captured your mother as you knew her? I can't really say that there's one. I think they all captured a piece of her. I mean, there's even some lovely photographs of my father's, uh, by my father in there. And I think he captures her at home, probably um, in a more honest way than anybody else. She's more relaxed, no makeup. And that's really the process we had to go through to select these. Uh, you know, how do you select the 100 best photographs of one of the most photographed women in the history of cinema? And it wasn't an easy uh, task. We first had to sort of decide, are we going for... Um, perfect photography, technically. Uh, And in the end, we opted for each photograph tells a story. Because you have 100 photographs here, and you almost have 100 different people, even though this is uh, such a recognizable face. Absolutely. Although some of them are of her very young as well. Um, uh, You you tell the story of Mark Shaw, a Life magazine photographer, who would pour over a day's shoot looking for that special quality that makes her so appealing. Did he ever... Put what he what he figured out into words. I uh, I don't know the details. I know we did a lot of research with respect to that, but all I can tell you is, just like the films, each photograph looks easy and light and delightful, and uh, you know, taking a good picture is like a day's shoot on the set. Well, you you mentioned that your father Mel Ferrer took uh, a, a number of these pictures. Was he an amateur photographer? I would say more than that because he was sort of a achieved filmmaker. You know, he was an actor, a dancer, a fencer, could ride horses. He was a producer. He directed. He did radio mm. uh, when he had polio during the war. And so uh, in the end, of course, he became a pretty good cameraman as well and, uh, and a wonderful photographer. He shot with a rolling flex. And he was fast, didn't take two or three of each, you know, uh, but he knew how to light you, the old-fashioned way um, and use the moment. And I think it shows up. So he liked the two and a quarter format. Yes, but uh, today he would be shooting with an with a telephone, wouldn't he? I don't think so. <laughs> he would because he was at Sarah. Did he did he develop his own prints as well? He did. One photo of your father and mother is in in a boxing ring, and it looks in hindsight like something of a metaphor for their relationship. Why was there so much friction in the marriage? Well, they are leaning against each other and both laughing. Yeah. I don't in, know in that picture, but the, uh, the boxing <clears throat> ring did remind me that there were problems. I don't. There were problems. There, there always are problems in relationships, and we all have to, with time, learn how to grow through them. Um, when you've got two people in the entertainment industry, two highly sensitive people, he was a difficult man. He was, um, at times, um, very self-centered, and I think she was a very. Um, non-assuming person. She didn't really ask for things or voice things. She's hoping that they would happen. And I think that kind of combination could be, um, you know, a difficult one and, 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 um, and make both of them sort of be disappointed after a while. What, what was it like for you and other members of the family? Uh, growing up, um, I love to say that I didn't know that she was famous. And really? it's true, yeah. I mean, you know, in those days we didn't have... We, she wasn't the kind of a star that had a screening room. There was no DVD or VHS or anything like that, so... But when she took you to school, people had to stare. Once we got to Rome, yes. In Switzerland, not so much. Mm-hmm. They left the letter B. And so first I knew her as a mom, as a full-time mom, one that gets you to, to school and shopping for socks and books and whatever. And, and then with time I realized what a wonderful actress she was. But I, I don't think it, until... It was until she she passed away that uh, we fully realized what her legacy had become, especially because of her work for the children through UNICEF. 
Well, we think of her as an American actress, but there's a very strong European component. Uh, the reason she that you grew a, up in, she was a British subject. She was, but, and she grew up in the Netherlands, didn't she? And she grew up in uh, in Holland. Yes. During the Nazi occupation. One of the longest occupied countries during the war. Did she talk about her war experiences? She did. She did. And I think that's one of the seeds that were pl- planted very early on that then connected her to the work for UNICEF later on. What, stucks, what sticks in my mind the most is that she uh, would always talk about the loss of everything we take for granted. You know, not so much the lack of food, heating, eating dog cookies and green bread because it was made from peas or tulip bulbs, but... The going out and not having the ability to be yourself, to express yourself, to be free. Part of the legend of Audrey Hepburn was that she served as a messenger for the underground during the occupation. It's partially a legend because, yes, she did carry messages in her shoes, but I don't think she knew. They told her they were love letters. Really? Uh, about two people who wanted to send a secret note. Because that, that would have been too much to, to get, uh, too much responsibility. And it may, it may have put that look on her face that would have singled her out and she would have gotten caught. So. Mm-hmm. Well, how did, what was her relationship with her parents later? Because uh... It was uh, a, a difficult and strained with her mother and inexistent with her father until much later in life. Now, he was an uh, ardent fascist supporter. So once she became fam- famous, at, at, at first, he didn't want to barge back in her life because he didn't want to sort of, by association, cause her any trouble. Mm-hmm. And then when she became really famous, he didn't want to go back and sort of appear like the dad who only shows up, hi, honey, now that you're rich. And so she found him through my father. They, they looked for him after the war, and uh, it was now the early 50s, actually, and uh, found him to the Red Cross, and she went to see him in, uh, in, uh, in Ireland and realized at that time that the man was really um, an emotional invalid. And uh, he couldn't make the gesture, he couldn't hug, he couldn't lift the arms. And so she compensated for that, that second realizing that, what she had missed, what she hadn't missed, and who he really was. Often the children of cold parents become very warm parents. Uh, Yeah, probably. Uh, She, like so many actresses, wanted to be a dancer at first. She did. Uh, And I've always wondered whether that isn't something that... uh, helps the acting even if the person stops dancing because they just have uh, a certain body language. And you learn a system, you know how to, you know, you know about effort and, um, and about hard, applying yourself to something. Um, you know, in the end, everything requires you to, to, to be in touch with, with yourself and uh, whether it's your body or your voice or you know, how you hold yourself. My guest is Sean Hepburn Ferrer, who, uh, it has written the foreword to a, a new collection of photographs, 100 photographs of Audrey Hepburn, called Audrey 100, rare and intimate photo collection selected by Audrey Hepburn's family. It's uh, published in a, a large uh, uh, coffee table edition by Sterling Publications, quite beautiful. Uh, what is the role of the family in producing these books? Well, we try and, um, you know, we have a nonprofit called the Audrey Hepburn Children's Fund. We created that after she passed away to sort of continue in her larger-than-life footsteps. And um, we believe that creating something um, other than a gala or, you know, a special event, something that's licensed, a beautiful collection of photographs, like in this case, or the book we had before called Audrey Treasures, the book that I wrote called Elegant Spirit, and we donate uh, our royalty share to the fund, is creating something that is beautiful, that is a keepsake, and it also has something that has legs and that can keep on ticking and generating a revenue for the kids. And so we like to do that. When did you realize uh, that she really was somebody who was famous? In fact, both of your parents were famous. You but, said you went to Italy. Uh, she, why wasn't she equally famous in Switzerland? Her, she her was equally famous, her. but the, the Swiss kind of were used to that. Um, and they kind of let you be, you know, your brain. Kind of like living in New York. And, uh, and, uh, <laughs> kind of, I guess. Um, and then the paparazzi chocolates. came out of the woodwork and then you sort of got in touch. But I think if fame is something that you use for good, uh, which is what it really should be in the end, uh, we really realized she was famous after she passed away. 
using it for good because she worked for the UN? Yes. How much did she get involved? A lot of movie stars wind up being listed to be goodwill ambassadors and uh, their name is attached to a letterhead. And, after, and they do after, else. after Danny Kaye, she sort of came in as a second uh, main player in that world. I mean, there wasn't... Yes, there were a few sort of dedicated people who had been part and ambassadors for years, like uh, Liv Woolman and uh, uh, Nana Muskuri and um, others. Um, but she was sort of the first one to take it to that level. While she was an ambassador for UNICEF, the company grew and doubled its income, and, and its employees went from uh, five to 10,000 employees. And, uh, and what's the mission of the Audrey Hepburn Children's Fund? It's really our vehicle to be able to create projects and products and, and, and uh, licenses within the world of nonprofit and then turn over the funds to any of our organizations. You can learn more about it at www.audreyhepburn.com. When I look over the list of her film credits, uh, I'm amazed that she wasn't the first choice in any number of roles where we can't imagine anyone else like My Fair Lady. Elizabeth Taylor was considered for that. And she thought, in fact, didn't she, that Julie Andrews, who originated the part on Broadway, should have been given the role? Uh, absolutely. She uh, put together a dinner uh, and the executives were convinced that she was going to announce that she was going to do the, the movie because she'd been offered the part. And little did they know that she, when they showed up, she spent the next hour and a half with my dad trying to beat into their heads that it should be Julie to do the part. In the end, having exhausted all possibilities and realizing that they weren't going to change their mind. She took the part and the rest is history. Julie got Sound of Music. And, and but it's also, well. it's also been widely reported that she was offended when her vocals were dubbed over by Marnie Nixon. She wasn't. She would have been the first one to agree with Emma Thompson's comments of late. Uh, she didn't take herself that seriously. Hmm. And that's what I think is in a way the secret of, of her true talent and... Um, and her for beauty, that she didn't sit there and sort of say how great she was. Then uh, it's been reported that Truman Capote wanted Marilyn Monroe for the role of Holly Golightly. If that's the case, we're lucky that he wasn't a casting director because... <laughs> that's perfect uh, casting. Okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, he's right. He's right, you know, but when you're in it, you can't see the forest from the trees. Uh -huh. That's why you have, that's why you hand the book over to filmmakers, you know. And to casting directors and to producers and directors. One of the photos uh, of her in this book is between takes while she's shooting breakfast at Tiffany's. She's sitting on a crane, tired, staring at her feet. Uh, it must, some of those shooting schedules must have been really wearing. They were. I mean, I had the great chance to work with her on one film, the Peter Bogdanovich film. And uh, she'd get up really early get her makeup on, be ready for the first take around 7 in the morning and have a, a, a little snack and a nap during lunchtime when everybody else sort of had a proper meal because she'd by then been up for 8 to 10 hours. I've uh, spoken to any number of contemporary actresses and actors who say, uh, well, the reason I did that film is I wanted to work with a certain director. And your mother worked with William Wilder, with Billy Wilder. Uh, Stanley Donan some pretty great directors. Did she choose those or was it just the the system at the time that w wound up putting her together with those people? I think the system at the time, um, she was not the kind of a, 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 a actress with a, with, a, with a production company developing her own things. She would look at the value of the script and at the package and probably place herself as the weakest link in that package and then decide whether to do it or not. And I think that's where my father played an extraordinary role as well. Uh, he did have great taste and great literary knowledge and uh, always pressed for the absolute best. And in situations like Funny Face, she's the one who pushed for Fred Astaire. He was getting older and sort of not getting as many parts. But like you said earlier, having wanting to be a dancer, uh, how can you be up there and not get a chance to dance with Fred Astaire? Gene Kelly would have been the only other choice. And my great thanks to her son, Sean Hepburn Ferrer, for being on our show today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me.